We couldn't be more happy to welcome EDF and Elizabeth Sturkin, a powerhouse of solutions, onto the stage to run this final, as I say, you're here for the best and final session on levelling up corporate action. So Elizabeth, please, the stage is yours. Thanks. No pressure. Woo. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, hi, I am Elizabeth Sturkin, Managing Director of Net Zero at Environmental Defense Fund, a global nonprofit that focuses on science, markets, and policy to drive systems change. We've been working with businesses for over three decades, and we're focused on finding and scaling solutions. So, I want to start with a story. From just from a couple of weeks ago, I was tucking my daughter in and she asked me, do you have hope? And she was reacting to a photo my son had sent. He's a sophomore in college in Southern California and he took a photo outside his dorm room of the hillside burning from wildfires. And it bothered her so much. I paused and I said, yes, I have hope. And I want to tell you why, because this question could not have come at a more urgent time. Here's what we're facing. You all know it, but I'm going to tell you, we have to cut emissions in half in less than 10 years by 2030, and we need to reach net zero by 2050. It is a monumental task. It can feel daunting. It is transformational change. It can even feel hopeless. But here's the thing. Whether or not the world's governments act, their business case for climate action is clear. Companies can do this. That's where you and I and the entire business community come in. We're seeing the cost of inaction rise faster than we have ever imagined. Supply chain disruptions, skyrocketing insurance, labor instability, something we call climate inflation. These these aren't abstract threats. They are already impacting bottom lines, which can make the case for action even stronger. The good news, the solutions are becoming cheaper every day. The net zero economy is not some far off idea. Companies that innovate to meet this moment are already seeing their market share grow. Just like every other wave of innovation, like the digital revolution, climate-friendly products and services are poised to be the next big thing. Better, more efficient, cost-effective. OK, let's get real. Knowing the problem and knowing the solution isn't enough. Doing, it, doing something about it is something else. I know many of you. For, at companies are facing headwinds from every angle, whether it's backlash against ESG initiatives, sheer flood of new regulations, complexity from voluntary standards, reporting requirements, media exposés, lawsuits, it can feel overwhelming. And it's hard to know where to start when you're trying to build and implement a meaningful climate strategy. Here's where today's panel comes in. You'll hear from leaders who have made climate power moves. They're reshaping entire industries. They're not just reacting to climate change, they are setting the pace and pulling others along with them. I want you to walk away today not just informed, but inspired and ready to act. The best part, we have the tools we need to act right now. The science is clear. The roadmaps exist. For those companies unsure where to start or how to train their workforce, there are abundant resources available. And I just have to tell you about EDF's Net Zero Action Accelerator, netzeroaction.org. It provides companies with the tools and trainings they need to make high-impact climate solutions. Think of it as your personal trainer. It democratizes access to the best science-based strategies out there. 
As I reflect on that conversation with my daughter and all of the experiences this week, I really feel that urgency. But I also feel a deep sense of energy and empowerment because of my work, but because of the work that you do too. I want to ensure that the next generation, the world she'll inherit, the wor world your children will inherit, has a fighting chance. So as you listen today, think about your own role. What can you do? What can your company do to be a climate power mover in 2025? I hope you leave energized and ready to act. The climate crisis can't wait. And now I'll pass it to our moderator, Neil Yeo, the founder and CEO of 1.5, a company training thousands of professionals worldwide in green skills. You might have read about his recent report in Axios. Thank you so much, Neil, for doing this. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yes. Great. Well, I have the absolute pleasure to moderate a star-studded panel. I don't think we can cover any more than on the communication side to authors, to practitioners, to advocacy. So with that, I'd love to invite our panelists to come to stage. Great. Oh yeah, anywhere that you want. All right, well thank you so much Elizabeth for that great introduction and just to bring it home to a personal story because we are living in this world that it's no longer a nice to do but a must do. And I think this year's sustainability and its time being the, the theme is that it was time in 2006 when Al Gore you know, sent his documentary. It was time when Greta Thunberg in 2020 you know, mobilized global politics. And, Yet again, it's time. And how do we just make sure that the tide that is coming is no longer just a trend and a fad, but actually what business needs to be? So with that, I'm going to take a couple of statistics from the Net Zero Action Accelerator. You should read the Insights Report, because it's great. Um, a couple of things. Climate ambition at the corporate level is still very much alive. Uh, Science-based targets have seen over 100% increase driven by Asia. We have 23,000 companies that have uh, submitted CDP, and more than half of companies actually driving clean energy, um, clean energy investments, more than governments and households. However, we know that scope three emissions, which are your value chain emissions, they don't have scope three supplier engagement. And to Kelly from HSBC and Akshat, author of Climate Capital, the trillions of dollars needed to finance our climate change um, transition, and even according to WEF, if the cost of inaction is between 2025 to 2100, is $1,266 trillion of cost of inaction just to put that out there. And to Bridget from Google.org, the rapid rise of AI and its potential to drive innovation, but yet the significant energy that it will require. And to Anjali from Speed and Scale, that according to your team, we're falling short of Fortune 500 companies making their net zero commitment. And then to Arman from Walmart, where we've seen corporations green hushing, backtracking from their ambitious goals, but others, like Walmart, actually leaning in <coughs> and communicating them publicly and embedding sustainability into their business practice. So I couldn't think of a better panel to cover these topics, so why don't we dive right in. Let's raise our ambition through shared storytelling and celebrate the journey that's very lonely. So with that, the first question I have for the panelists is, what has been your climate challenge and goal that your organization has faced? And how have you addressed them? Well, as a journalist, uh, I don't have climate goals uh, <laughs> for my organization. I, I get to report on uh, other people's climate goals. Um, I would say I'd pick a, a story to, say, to tell you about how challenges can be quite different in different contexts. So um, one of the places uh, that I've uh, had the pleasure to report from is my home country, India. And uh, India has, over the past 10 years, seen a massive solar boom. And you know that's allowed it to reduce the number of coal power plants that it's built. But when you look at a business trying to do what uh, you need to do to build solar plants, it's actually quite difficult because it's not as simple as you build a solar plant, it's cheap, 
the power producer will get money, people will have cheap electricity, because there are all these transactions that we take for granted in most developed countries are actually quite, uh, there's a lot of friction in those places. So uh, I tell the story of Renew in my book, Climate Capitalism. It's one of the world's largest renewable energy companies. It's got now a 10 gigawatt portfolio, most of which is solar. And in its journey to get there, it had to do all the things that developed country solar companies do, but also create a payments group, group inside the company that would go and harass the public utilities in India, which are very highly indebted and do not have the money to pay the people who are producing power um, and ensure that those payments came through. Because if they didn't get that payment, then how would they be able to pay for the debt that they had taken on to build a solar plant? And how would their shareholders be able to invest in the company? So it starts from that small supply chain uh, of payments, right? This, we're not talking about materials, we're not talking about labor. Uh, a very simple payment transaction. That too, they had to do what in India we call jugad or hustling to make sure that that payment came through. Uh, but those are the sort of small challenges that add up when we look at trying to meet climate goals because all of us want clean energy, we want renewables to succeed, but it's not always as simple as yeah. it seems. Thank you so much. And that through line on the financing side and the capital side, couldn't think of a better person but Kelly from HSBC mm. to talk about what your challenging goal has been, particularly as a big bank. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I just had my nine-year anniversary at HSBC, and, and I'd started in banking, and then I went to automotive for seven years, and I wasn't sure about returning to finance. I was a little trepidatious and said, I don't know. I love selling cars, I thought it was fun, <laughs> from the Midwest. And, but I was a couple months on the job at HSBC and, and ostensibly my job was supposed to be philanthropy, right? Which was what I've devoted my career to. And um, a client said to the treasury team, we want to meet your sustainability head. And they said, what? We want to meet your sustainability head. We've met you guys, we get it. But we want to meet your sustainability head. And I come from a background of that's the bread and butter of the company. So I said yes. I had about five different people in five different departments, including someone in my own, say, no, don't go. It's not your job. And I said, well, but the client asked for it. Of course I'm going to go. And it started me and a bunch of other little fire starters around the bank on this journey of, well, why wouldn't we bring our sustainability people in to talk to the clients? And it was, it was revolutionary. Um, and it reminded me that yes, working in automotive was amazing and people need cars to get where they're going. Um, and luckily it was Toyota, so they were on the, the cutting edge at the time with the Prius. But, but finance has such a profound power in the world. And so then cut to, I'm pregnant, I get on the plane to Arkansas and, and we launch a sustainable supply chain finance program with Walmart. We're the world's biggest trade bank. And Walmart trusted us and we sat across them and they said, yeah, let's, Let's treat our suppliers a little differently based on the bank's payments, based on how we're rating them. And boy, did the Walmart story, I mean, everyone at our bank now repeats that still, because it was a fire starter within HSBC of Walmart will take a chance on us, and Walmart wants us to deliver this. It isn't this nice thing to do when you have the time and the resources. It's actually something we all should do because our clients want it. And so that's been revolutionary, but to, to your point, Neil, we estimated our net zero transition plan earlier this year that $122 trillion is needed to be deployed by 2030 just in the markets where HSBC operates. I mean, we operate in a lot. It's a little over 60, but that's astonishing. So we have a $1 trillion commitment of sustainable finance to deploy by 2030. We have a $1 billion climate tech commitment. Um, and the... The, the, the way that I've seen everyone mobilize behind this and the infrastructure that was needed internally to make it happen and how quickly we're moving has been really profound. And it all came from me just, you know, me being one of the people that didn't say no. Wow. Thank you, Kelly, for interweaving that personal story. And you mentioned Walmart, and Walmart has been charging its way through sustainability, but particularly with Armand's role in communications, it can be tricky sometimes when it comes to is sustainability just something we do as a CSR ploy, or is it really truly part of our company DNA? So, Man, would you like to cover your challenge and goal? Sure. Uh, I mean, I will say I've been at Walmart just over three years, but I've been in sustainability communications pretty much most of my career, including a lovely few years at Futera. So, hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have learned so much that I, I feel like all of my career was building up to 
prepare me for Walmart because Fortune 1 was not necessarily my next role. <laughs> but right time, right space, it, you know, destiny. And I feel like the biggest motivation for me was if you can turn the switch on even one thing the right way, this company has the scale to get it right and send the right market signal. And that was kind of my biggest motivation to take on the role. So where I sit today is I, I, I sit in the global communications team. I lead sustainability, as well as a newer team at Walmart called the Energy Transformation Team. Um, and their charge is really to rethink how Walmart thinks of energy security, not just for the company, but for our communities and our customers. How do we make it accessible, affordable, very much about how the companies always thought about products, helping people save money and live better? Where does energy play into that? And so that's been very fascinating to watch as the strategy starts to come together. Um, and in terms of the challenge, I will say back to Kelly's point about the work we're doing with HSBC, it all came together through a program we call Project Gigaton, which Walmart launched in 2017. Um, back then, there were really no supplier engagement programs to help suppliers just come together and start working on sustainability. And so Walmart put this platform together with NGOs like EDF and WWF supporting us and really guiding us on how do we make it rigorous, how do we create the tools to help suppliers move forward. Let's not look for perfection. Let's just start moving forward. What's a two-year goal? What's a five-year goal? What, do, what does your emissions footprint even look like? Back in 2017, a lot, of our, a lot of our suppliers were still grappling with that. So the platform was set up to a, help them, but we knew we needed a goal to get everyone galvanized. So we just set a goal, again, guided by our NGO partners, and we said, one gigaton, which is a billion metric tons of emissions, we want to reduce by 2030. And it gained traction very quickly because the suppliers started to see this was not a reputation play. This was not a nice to do. It was helping them save money. It was helping them become more efficient. They were starting to have different types of conversations with Walmart merchants about the assortment. Um, and so they helped us achieve this goal six years early, this, uh, earlier this year in February. And I tell this story because it's a very much a story about supplier engagement and moving the industry forward in a real way. But from a communication perspective, it's more powerful because I didn't have to tell the story in February. Our executive team talked about it in our investors call during our earnings call for the year. And that to me is the success. It was built into how we are now talking about business growth and how we're charting the way forward with sustainability very much built in, where the company is really owning it we don't have to kind of be the ones influencing, saying, can we talk about this? Can we get 30 seconds on your schedule to talk about this? You know, it's, it's really kind of coming from within and with our suppliers because it makes sense as a business case. Yeah, I love that. Um, and it just shows how much embedded sustainability, which is a jargon term to basically say that every person's job, regardless of their sustainability team or not, has a role to play. Not everyone needs to be a greenhouse gas accounting expert, but with some basic climate fluency, if not the KPIs and manager levels, we can actually significantly create change. And so three statistics to bring that home is that companies that embed sustainability, meaning everyone has some kind of a skill set, is able to generate 16% more revenue, is outperforming its peers by 52%, and two times more likely to actually see cost reductions, which I think you covered. And I think sometimes we need to think about not sustainability as a cost function, but as a value creation. And I think if there's something you can bring from that, it is not, not nice to do, but a must do in business. And so speaking about the future of business, uh, we can't not have a conversation without AI coming up. Uh, it's one of the talk of the town, apparently, at the UN, just down the road. Um, and Bridget, we know that you know, Google has such a high ambition. We've heard that AI could actually create really innovative solutions, even for the climate world, in the methane side of things and many other use cases, but also has like a huge amount of energy. So we'd love to open it up to you uh, about the challenge and goal that you're leading. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, I've been joking that I've, I've been at Google.org, which is Google's philanthropy, been doing work on AI and impact for the last seven years. And I've been joking that everyone like came to our party, but we just don't have quite enough snacks and drinks for all <laughs> the folks who are here. So um, <laughs> everyone's welcome. Um, but it has been definitely a, a transition in the conversation, to your point. 
Listen, yeah, you're right. We, we deeply believe as a company and through our work in the philanthropy that AI solutions are going to be able to help. We are already seeing how they are helping to drive innovative work across so many parts of the climate mitigation and adaptation work that we have to do. And I think as a you know, technology company, as someone at the forefront of that revolution, we also believe we have a real responsibility to be driving those solutions as well. And so one of the things that we committed to um, Meant, uh, now a number of years ago is actually to work with our the individuals that are using our products, our partners, governments, to, to collectively reduce a gigaton as well of, of CO2 equivalent by 2030. And this is by virtue of you know, using our technology, powering folks, so examples in this work are the work that we did on fuel efficient routing, which is the little leaf that comes up um, in your Google Maps, which is now, um, the new numbers are showing that since it launched, we are now um, looking at about 3 million metric tons of, of CO2 that have been reduced, which is equivalent wow. to, to yeah, <laughs> 600, over 600,000 cars a year coming off the road. These are small nudges that we have. You know, we have this billion user product. And I think the real um, unlock for us in setting this target was to be able to think about how do we use our core business and our unique capacity and our unique capability as a company to actually create change? How do we make this not just about our footprint, which we'll, we can talk about, obviously. Um, we have work to do there, too. But how do we really bring our core product work together, our AI research teams, you know, the folks that are really at the forefront of this technology to focus on climate issues? And to do that, I think, really took a, you know, as many people have already referenced, or to coming together of, you know, coalition of the willing internally and a lot of strong executive leadership. And setting this goal has been quite helpful because now, despite the, the headwinds that we're facing in many fronts, we have a commitment to do it. And so it's requiring us to think differently about how we prioritize AI research projects, for example. So work like um, you might have seen, we have work announced last year on contrail reduction, where we're partnering with airlines. Um, a huge portion of the aviation contribution to warming comes from contrails, which if you're not familiar, are the white plumes behind planes. They trap heat. Uh, and although it's not an emissions play, it is obviously an important part as we think about getting to, to um, our goals on, on warming in general. And so um, the changes that can happen in elevation, which we've been able to predict how controls might form, work with pilot in pilots um, with airlines like American Airlines to actually implement changes with their pilots to now reduce contrails production by, by over 50%, which is having commensurate effects on warming. This isn't a pilot stage, but it's the kind of thing, again, that gets motivated and gets support in the company because we have these goals to reach. Um, I, will, I will say a word about um, we, we, a challenge we have in front of us that we don't have a solution to entirely get is how do we kind of keep on the net zero trajectory. <clears throat> we are still committed to doing that. I think we are seeing lots of of uh, load challenge on the especially US grid right now for lots of reasons. Obviously, the increase in, in data center growth, you know, in EVs, manufacturing, there's a whole host of things as well as underinvestment in the grid for many, many years, which I'm sure many folks are familiar with. And I think we're continuing to think about how do we work on both the demand side of that, continuing to optimize, continuing to think about ways we can both build more efficient models, but also more efficiently run data centers. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting engineering problem, right, as well which we continue to be committed to, while at the same time working on the supply side and working hard to accelerate the clean energy that we continue to bring online as a company. Um, and I would just say as a philanthropy, right, we view our role also, and I think it's a call to action from corporate philanthropies in the house, where if you're not working yet with your corporate philanthropy, to be a part of that climate solution too and be funding the organizations in the ecosystem. You know, as we think about net zero in Asia, for example, how do we have the ecosystem shift that we need to have to get there. It's not going to happen through any one company. We need to have collaboration, and that's a place where we've been, for example, able to put some yeah. money. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much. And, and talking about goals, who knows uh, OKRs, Objective Key Results, John Dewar's book, <laughs> I definitely Measure do. What Matters. <laughs> we, we live and breathe by OKRs on our Notion page all the time, and it, it surprised me that I heard about it and, and finally read it, but Speed and Scale, which was um, authored by John Dewar, basically applies OKRs to the goals that we need to track to keep our future alive. So with that, um, Jolly, would you like to share your work and what challenge and goal you're working on? Yeah, so um, thanks, Neil. We, you know, I'll take you back a couple years ago. We were working on speed and scale in 2020. We all had a little bit of time on our hands. And uh, <laughs> so we, we set out to develop what would become the plan that underpins the book. 
And as part of that exercise, we wanted to understand what the state of corporate climate commitments were. Uh, it seemed like a great time to be doing so. There was lots of reports coming out in the media about companies making net zero goals, um, about setting net zero goals, about uh, be, be committing to be a carbon neutral. Uh, at that moment in time, we thought those were more or less adding up to the same thing. Um, we all, Amazon had recently decided to uh, acquire the naming rights to a little arena in Seattle called the Climate Pledge Arena. So we thought we were really living in the golden age of climate commitments. <laughs> Um, or, you know, or, or so we thought. Uh, we were quickly, we, we delved in, um, and we were kind of dazzled. Uh, dazzled is maybe the wrong word. We were, we were a little surprised with what we found. Um, in digging into the sustainability reports of the Fortune Global 500, we were confronted with a buffet of terminology. And I brought a little list here, actually, to just read <laughs> off some of the terms that we found in these reports um, in, that were describing companies' commitments. Carbon free, carbon negative, carbon neutral, carbon positive, climate neutral, net neutrality, net positive, net zero, net zero carbon, peak emissions, real zero, I don't know what fake zero is, <laughs> Production and zero emissions. And so, uh, needless to say, we realized that some work needed to be done, so our team got to work um, and really dug into those reports. And what we found in 2022 was that 6% of global Fortune 500 companies had a true net zero commitment in place. So what does a true net zero commitment look like? It's the same one that the planet needs, the same equation the planet needs to use, which is you reduce emissions as much as possible, you offset those only with permanent removals, and that's how you get to zero. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk, uh, in 2023, uh, we did that same analysis, and what we found is that 9% of the global Fortune 500 had true climate commitments, had true net zero commitments. And so we haven't seen you know, a terrible amount of growth. We haven't seen the kind of growth that we would need um, for us to really be decarbonizing at the pace that science wants us to. Um, it's not to disparage all of the great corporate action that's being done. It simply tells us that we're a little bit away from where we need to go. I think most folks understand that. Um, but we find that climate commitments, you know, in the conversation around climate action tend to, you know, not be the thing that people get super excited about talking about, but they are the harbinger to action. So if you want to talk about greater climate ambition, if you want to talk about more climate action, we have to get those commitment numbers up. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Wow. Well, we heard about the challenges, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's an opportunity. You know, when there's lemon, you can make lemonade, and I think a lot of people here are that. And so I'm flipping it over to what we named the panel, which is Power Moves, right? We want to leave you with something that's ambitious. But as an introduction to lead by example, I'm the CEO and founder of 1.5. We're a climate advisory and academy. And our power move, just leading it out there, was about 18 months ago, we realized that we're spending more than half of our time educating people on sustainability. What is Scope 123? What is CSRD? What is this? What is that? And as an advisory firm, I was advised maybe you shouldn't train people on what you do. But I felt that there was a need to rise the sea level of knowledge and simplicity to understand this, because if it's complex, we won't get anywhere. And so we built a curriculum, and our power move was, in the last 18 months, we have trained and activated 700 sustainability professionals across 45 countries in 15 hubs, including the Africa continent to LATAM, who are garnering around actual hard green skills that they can apply, now leading net zero within their organizations, even without being on the sustainability team. So in terms of power moves, I think that there is just so much that we can do, not only to build the workforce in terms of the skills, but the professionals that are working on it in different parts. So if you're a person moving into climate, we just really encourage you that you don't need to be like us to have an impact. I think every person's role with a tiny bit of training could go a long way. So we need to stop scouting the sustainability unicorns, which we've called are just like the limited people who just have the social proof to do the work and realize that there is no one pathway to a climate career and that we all have unique skill sets to bring. Mm -hmm. So with that, I would love to ask you, what is your power move for 2025? Um, I, can, I can start again. I'll, I'll give an example uh, of a company. So when Anjali was reading out that list, it gave me a headache because <laughs> <laughs> that's what I have to do when I'm covering sustainability reports from companies. I have to like parse out what is real here and what's the marketing mm -hmm. uh, glitz that's hiding the real numbers. You may have to redline my pitch next time <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, 
all companies are trying, but the way they are trying is very hard to compare because of the, the different measures that they put out. Now, let's look at one type of emissions, so scope two emissions. In some way, we actually don't talk about scope two emissions as much as we really should. Um, and you know, with what's happening with AI, even more reasons to talk about scope two, because scope two is basically electricity emissions. And for a long time, the way most companies have been managing their scope two emissions has been by procuring renewable energy, but they don't tell you exactly how. And most of that renewable energy comes from these uh, certificates, they're called renewable energy certificates, where, which, you know, at one point, in principle, the, the process is power produced from a coal power plant combined with a renewable energy certificate becomes green power. And that is not correct. Uh, in a past era where you had only 5%, 10% renewables on the grid, you could have made an argument that that certificate could work. But a series of academic work that have been done over the past 10 years have shown that that doesn't work. So it's been interesting to watch which companies are moving away from renewable energy certificates towards uh, clear targets, a clear a procurement of clean energy from directly the producer. So if you sign up a power purchase agreement uh, that is going to ensure that it is your money that has created that power plant, then you're actually adding clean energy to the grid. Uh, so not to, not to shout out this company because uh, we have Bridget on the uh, uh, panel, but Google is the, the one company in the AI race which is not using renewable energy certificates uh, as of 2024, as of 2023. And so uh, watching Google versus, say, Amazon or Microsoft, uh, who are all committed to meet their climate goals, but seeing how they're taking scope too seriously, how they're going after 24 seven renewables, creating a real plan and because they're not using those certificates, actually showing that they have scope to emissions, that they are not zero, as most companies claim, uh, has been, I think, a power move, even though it makes you look worse than your yeah. competitors. Man, you're doing my job for me. Just <laughs> asking yeah. directly across. Bridget, I can't help but ask yeah. your family. Um, no, I, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, part of the challenge, right, of, our, of what's ahead of us is that we have committed to operating 24-7 carbon-free, and that doesn't, that's not available yet. Right? So that is a problem that's not just ours, that is everyone's. And we hope by naming that, it will create the, the shift that we need to all see. Um, and I'll put a small plug in for TEKS, which is this sort of um, very wonky uh, acronym, but, but is a basically how we, to get to 24 seven, we have to have time stamped energy understanding, right? Where in the grid, where, where is this energy from, at what time? Um, and so it's new standard as we think about moving from renewable energy certificates and some of the things that we're familiar with, how do we sort of also build this ecosystem? And this is another place where actually our philanthropy, so we've tried to seed some of that early standards work, you know, building the ecosystem, doing research around it. So again, if your corporate philanthropy isn't doing climate, it's still a tiny fraction of corporate philanthropies are, it's a great opportunity to go give them a call. Um, I would like to highlight one power move, which is uh, satellites. <laughs> um, so we um, are seeing more purpose-built satellites for climate, and we need that because we need that kind of global picture. So earlier this year, EDF launched methane sat, and it's an incredible project. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. satellite, <laughs> methane sat is an incredible project that is going to give us a global picture that we need for methane. We have the global methane pledge, pledge and that's great. We need that sort of policy action, but to pair that Action, action in the right way. We need the data to hold people to account, to understand where emissions are coming from, and to be able to see the progress that we're hopefully going to make. And so this satellite will allow us to, to, the satellite constellation will allow us to do that. We at Google are partnering with that. Again, how can we be helpful in this? We can be bringing our AI modeling to help improve the way that it's happening. We can help to make the actual downlink and processing of that amount of data more efficient and more full. And then all of that data is going to be available on Google Earth Engine, which is an open scientific platform. So again, what else can we do with that information? How will that interact with other pieces? And I think the more that we can kind of build these pictures, and I'll just say that um, we are continuing sort of this work with work that we also originally kind of um, originated with EDF and have grown out into a new organization called Earth Fire Alliance, which now was announced um, just last week called FireSat. So this will be a purpose-built constellation that can detect 
um, soccer field size fires. We've never had the ability to early detect wildfires. Um, obviously, we need to be thoughtful about how we manage fire, but as we think about mega fires, the kind of fires that we're seeing that we heard um, earlier spoken about today, we don't have that kind of early detection, and it's both an obviously an adaptation play, but also a mitigation play when we think about the CO2 that's released there, and also when we think about regions like the tropics. So this will be something that has global coverage. We're not there yet. Protoflight is next year. We have a way to go, but we're really excited about that, and that's something that, you know, as Google.org, we've put money into, but our research team has also on the AI side been building the spectrometry, thinking about the modeling. So again, trying to bring sort of our full set of capacities together. So our power move is satellites. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's that amazing. A, um, and I guess the deployment of capital. We also have the private yes. capital. HSBC is obviously leading the charge. What is your bold move in 2024? Well, I mean, it complements what, what Bridget was saying so much. I mean, next year we will be halfway to deploying the trillion dollar commitment in sustainable wow. finance we made. We'll be over our $1 billion climate tech venture debt commitment. And I think that that's a very logical place to stop and examine what fi our finance has facilitated. And I love what both of you said, right? If if we can use the power of finance to drive our clients' goals forward, like Gigaton, let's stop and take stock and say, what, what kind of impact are we having? We're the bank that, and I see this time and time again because we often come in with other banks on lending, we're very, very strict with what we'll call green, what we'll call social, what we'll call sustainably linked. So let's stop next year and take a look at it and say, what have we actually facilitated with this incredible amount of finance? So I think it's a really logical point to check in on that to the same way AI is enabling finance. We need to that, have that moment as a bank. And then the other power move for me, because I'm a career philanthropist, I'm not, not a banker, um, <laughs> but uh, my other, I think, trend or, or thing that really has to matter is we need to put the human beings back in the climate conversation. Um, we launched a, oh, thank you, one person. Um, <laughs> we don't know each other. Um, but, uh, you know, we launched this great report on Monday, thanks to Ji Ho Kang on my team with Brookings, that's about the just and inclusive transition. And I think we've let people make climate a a dry science story that people think, well, it's not about humans. And so um, I'm really excited to, to use philanthropy, which is my area, to demonstrate blended finance. So we're investing in green energy and green jobs for low, low income people, not just here in the United States, but everywhere. And that should lift them up so that they're seen as financially viable and part of the, a, an exciting market opportunity. So for every grant I make in green energy or green jobs, we, HSBC was the sole financer, for example, of a $114 million solar project a couple months ago with a company named Doral in this low, low income community in Ohio where I went to college. And it's gonna power 9,000 homes, it's gonna create thousands of jobs, and it's gonna bring $400,000 of tax revenue into this little county in Appalachian, rural Ohio, where I swear to God, when I was going to school there, the bank, the first bank of Nelsonville was a motor home. And we used to joke that it was the easiest bank heist ever because you could just load, <laughs> pull up your pickup truck and hitch it up and <laughs> drive away. Um, but like, this is a game changer, right? And so I wanna see the ways that, that philanthropy and finance are more linked to each other. So those are my two big 2025 power moves. Wow. And just bringing that into the business, once you have the capital, there's so much that you can do. Man, tell us about your power move. I think a couple of things I'll say. One, I think for us, the goals are set. The work is happening. We've thrown a lot at the board. We're starting to see what's working. I think next year is going to be all about focus and embed. Mm. Given the scale of our company, whether it's energy, you know, we don't have the data center issue. We, are, we have the opposite of that, which is we're so distributed, we're everywhere, which means we have someone in charge of 800 utility relationships. Mm. He's, you know, he's on the phone pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, who are you? You're God, um, really, at this point. Um, and, and you know, that's just one piece of it. So I think for us next year is going to be very much about focus and embed. And on the embed piece is where I think I personally feel a lot of ownership from a communication perspective because the storytelling needs to happen outside of our echo chamber. 
right? Example like the example I gave about the gigaton announcement coming through earnings. Um, when we see our peers in global communications across Walmart telling stories with sustainability built in, that's a win for us. Um, so that we can more and more become the subject matter experts and they own the success of how this is helping them become better at what they're doing. So I think that it has to be increasingly, and the last thing I'll say on the people front, like when you said Jugaad, I started laughing, because I was here Monday, and one of the things I said was, I think half of my job, or most of my job is spent hustling. <laughs> I'm not a comms person, I'm hustling and trying to influence internally and externally to bring people on the same page about why this matters, how can this matter, how we tweak it to make it matter. And so I think that also, ooh, ooh it's okay. <laughs> From a communication perspective, I think we have a challenge ahead, which is how do we start telling cleaner, more straightforward stories, not get hung up on neutrality and carbon positive yeah. and all the, all the words out there and just kind of be able to move the needle forward. Yeah. Nice, nice wow. said. Yeah. Uh, and I partly left you to learn because I don't know if you have another sheet of paper or an Easter egg. It was waiting for an challenge. <laughs> but no, I mean, we have the OKRs. They are we clearly set out. And so I'm very curious about what you think your um, power move is for 2025. Yeah, you know, I um, thought a lot about this question. And I think there's in incredible being, work being done just across every sphere of the economy. You've got companies like Maersk out there, largest shipping company in the world, who made a commitment to be net zero by 2050. Um, they're a you know a big player in in the global shipping industry, but they're also in a in the sort of so-called hard to abate sector. Um, but they made that commitment in 2018. Uh, three years before COP26, um, and then they, three years later, decided to bring their commitment forward and be net zero by 2040. Um, so there, there's, there, there's no shortage. I mean, we've heard on this stage, we, you hear it in, in the media of, of so many amazing things that are being done. I think what, when you zoom out to the perspective that we're looking at, what we're worried about is that you've got a few players out there that are doing some really exceptional things, but by and large, you're not seeing the kind of progress that you need from the vast majority of companies. Um, and so, you know, really the power move that we have is maybe the most basic one of all, which is like we need to move the dial on that 9% of companies that have net zero commitments in place. We need more of those companies to make audacious commitments today tomorrow um, and every day thereafter and continue to build action those commitments and then build on them. Um, you know, climate commitments are, are a little bit, have been likened to uh, New Year's resolutions, which is that they're easy to make and they're hard to keep. Um, <laughs> I think that's true, but, and, and I think we need, we need to see action on both those fronts and we need to see the measurement. So, you know, one of the big beliefs that we have is that we can't measure what we don't, we can't manage what we don't measure. Um, and so to make sure that companies are continuing to invest in that, we see 54% of the global Fortune 500 um, puts out a sustainability report where they're sharing their emissions with the world and continuing to do better on that. Um, but if you work for an organization that does not represent what's happening um, in terms of uh, really great work on the commitment side or on the measurement side, we know where to start and there's a long way to go. Amazing. Well, that was, I don't know if you didn't get some kind of inspiration from that, but that is phenomenal. Um, uh, a moderator's dream, I've got the timer here and we've got time, so uh, maybe this could be a one lightning round across. I love to ask this, and you know, the thematic here, we're halfway through Climate Week, can you believe that? And, and can we give a round more of applause? More than halfway, to, please. More than yeah. halfway, okay. <laughs> Gosh, I might lose track of time. Make it three but, fourths. Um, <laughs> can, can, can we give a hand to Elizabeth and the EDF team? I mean, they yeah. literally have put this together such a great panel. Um, and so bringing it back to our theme of, of leaving with some sense of ambition, and think maybe one anecdote was it wasn't that long ago we had a hole in the ozone layer. Right? And the United Nations was trying to figure out how do we actually garner people and we had public, private sector. Yes, perhaps the solutions were clearer then about what we needed to act on, but it's clear just from the group here and everyone else that I met that we have the clear pathways mm -hmm. to net zero. And so we now are seeing a closing of the ozone layer. Why can't we see not uh, only a, a slowing down of the warming of the earth, but maybe a cooling of it? Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, what is the final parting like, piece of like the one-liner that you would mm -hmm. like to leave with people. Now, I'll lead by example. I believe every job can be a climate job yes. with the right access to green skills. You do not need to be in the sustainability team 
to have an outsized impact. So please, like, take that your way. That's great. <laughs> yeah. If I'm just doing one sentence, I'll just do the, the first sentence of my book, which is, it is now cheaper to save the world than destroy it. Yeah, I love that. We just need to get on yeah. with the work now. Well, Neil, I'm looking at the timer here, and it seems like we got a few minutes, so I may not do one <laughs> sentence. I'll tell you, the thing that give me, gives me hope and that, that I wish every person knew is that when you go back in time about 10 years and you look at temperature projections for the year 2100, what you would have seen is that the projections were about 3.9 degrees. We were looking at living in a very hot, basically an un, un, uninhabitable, um, did I get that right, uh, wor uh, world. And, uh, <laughs> And now, today, if you look at those projections, it's about 2.7 degrees. We have lowered the temps, quite literally, with the policy action, with the technologies that we're seeing deployed today. No one here wants to live in a 2.7 degree world, let's be clear, but we have made progress and we can continue to make much more. Yeah, that's great. I think, you know, I'll, I'll repeat again, I think that it is important that as we, as we are all sitting in our companies and the organizations that we are in, that we are using our greatest assets for climate work. So not just on the margins where we can, but every, every tool in our toolkit mm -hmm. and, um, and thinking about how that applies and not just also to mitigation, which I agree, there's so much progress and hope, but also thinking about adaptation as well and how we continue to maintain the balance of that work to make sure that the people who are being affected by climate now are a part of the conversation. Yeah. That's it. I mean, I'll pick up on, on where you guys left, which is I, I very, very personally feel that this is, it is up to each of us. And, and the context I'll put that in is use your resume just like you use your wallet as a conscious consumer. Choose who you work with, what you work on. Mm -hmm. Every role does not have to be a sustainability role, but it can be built in. Yes. Get in, use your skills. Some of us are really good at writing, some of us are really good at accounting, and we need everyone on the bench. Um, there is such a big difference when people bring, bring passion with them, um, even just to ask questions. Just ask the questions. You don't need to be the technical expert. I will say that is the only way we're going to get this right, because I have a six-year-old at home who wakes up sometimes in the middle of the night and will say, there's a fire, and we're all going to die. <laughs> like, like bringing it back. He's six. Yeah. He doesn't have any real-life experience of what that means, but he's picking up the anxiety, I yep. think, that we're all kind of demonstrating <laughs> in some ways. You know? And I, I really I, I don't know how to guide my kids. I, I can't, don't have that. But kind of that future lens anymore and what the next 20 years will look like. But then you bring it right back, you read some of these, you know, these quotes and you're like, I can manage what I can manage tomorrow and for the next one year. And so to me, I think the biggest strength is in our roles as professionals and consumers, of course. Oh, so That's great. Um, Aman and I have been friends for a long time, and I, my daughter's about to turn sex, and I actually think we should get the kids together, because we took my daughter out to clean up garbage at the Hudson River sweep earlier this spring, and she not only cleaned up a lot of garbage on the Hudson River, but lectured everyone going by. There was like a, there was like a walk a thon, and she was like, we're cleaning up trash. <laughs> Did you leave this? Don't do this. So I think together, <laughs> they'd be uh, unstoppable. No, Jen, Jen Alpha's coming for us all. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you never want to end with someone from a bank on the, you're going to end on a more uplifting note for us, I hope. But <laughs> I, I, I think there's been a real call to action to really look at your commitments here today and be clear about them and not use jargon. I will have a call to action for you of every commitment that is made, say, how are you going to pay for that? Sounds great. How are you going to finance that? Because I meet amazing sustainability people in the industry all the time and I say, have you talked to your bank? Because that sounds expensive. <laughs> no, we didn't know. Are we allowed to talk to our bank or our internal treasury people? Yes, of course you are. I mean, you said, use, you said every use every tool, but it's amazing how people don't do that. And that was what was so moving about, moving about working with Walmart is it's expensive what you're asking your suppliers to do in particular. That's where your biggest part of your footprint is. 
how are they going to pay for that, right? Don't put this huge ask on them and then expect them to figure it out. They, they operate on a thin margin. So that, I know it's not really touchy-feely, but... Um, I'll offer something touchy-feely. Yes, if you thank you. 10 seconds. <laughs> can, can we share this as our screensaver on Zoom and team meetings? Because yes. it's a great message, yeah. Yeah. I think, for, for a conversation. Thank you um, for saving me. Can have said it better. <laughs> Well, literally down to the second, when we talk about challenges, I mean, I hope you come out of this seeing the opportunity to build our future. It's going to be done in our generation. It doesn't matter if you're 80 plus years old or even six years old. We all have a part to play, and this greatest crisis, but actually opportunity to build our future is today. And so with that, can we round of applause and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.